All right, so I am going to introduce Catherine here before I eat up any of her time. But before I introduce her, Catherine Headley, SANS instructor. I've had the honor of teaching with her, being in Paris shut down with her, <laughs> experiencing total chaos during COVID. But Kat is brilliant. Um, she knows so much. The way that sh you explain things, Kat, like as a seasoned SANS instructor, sitting back and watching you break it down to a level that everyone has a way to approach the topic is fantastic. And that's why I really appreciate you doing something like this deeper 101, because sometimes we take things and make them so complex in our worlds and they really don't need to be. So thank you for your approach that everyone can take something away from. I really appreciate it. All right, yeah. thanks Kat. Awesome, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you lovely, lovely people who are on the other end of this call. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because I appreciate there's a mixture of, of those those things in here. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you uh, for the next uh, hour and a bit on, on digital forensics, what that means and, and how we kind of break it down uh, into, first of all, what is digital evidence? Because if we don't understand the evidence that we're dealing with, then how do we start to explain forensics? Then starting to talk about an investigation, what that process is and, and, and what it kind of means in terms of digital forensics. Then I'm actually going to talk about digital forensics because that's what we're all here for. And last but not least, why am I talking about this? How does this actually help people? What does digital forensics do? Um, and, and what kind of results can we get from that? So that's, that's the, the process I'm going to go through and, and what I'm going to talk about today. And first of all, uh, in case anybody doesn't know what DFIR stands for, because I appreciate that is plastered all over the summit, all over my slides, I've called this DFA 101, uh, just digital forensics and incident response. It is, it's a common acronym that we use. And I am referring to digital forensics a lot in this presentation. So I'm focusing more on the DF side of, of that acronym but I will touch on incident response as well. So just to give you a flavor of, of what that is and, and how that translates as well across. I've lost my buttons again. Oh, there we go. Hey, cool. Okay, so first thing, what do I mean by digital evidence? I simply mean it's digital information that may be of potential, rele of potential relevance to my investigation that is either stored or transmitted in some sort of digital format on some sort of digital device or traversing a, a network of some sort. And that breaks down into what we call data and metadata. Data is just information that can be transmitted or processed. It's just digital information of some sort. Metadata is also data. It's a specific type of data that provides information about other data. So data that describes other data. And when we talk about digital evidence, we are talking about these two things. And what does that mean in real life? I have a photograph here. Uh, this photograph uh, was actually taken in Australia, um, looking out on the, on the Great Barrier Reef. So this photograph, you can see there's, there's a boat, there's some trees, that photograph itself is data. That's just what I mean by data. It's, it's files on the system, it is content. Metadata is information that's describing that. So it's things like the file name, the size, the created timestamp, the time that that file was last modified, the path, the file path for that particular file. And that is data, as I say, that describes it. It's not the photograph itself. And talking about metadata, there are actually two different types of metadata. Just to, to complicate things a little bit further, there is metadata that is stored completely separate to the file. And that is what we call file system metadata. And I'll come on to explain what I mean by a file system, but that is metadata that is stored on the system, not anywhere near the file itself or not within the file itself. It's dependent on the type of, of file system that you have. And this includes things like the file name, timestamps, file size, all those things I showed you on that previous slide. You then have potentially a second type of metadata. This is dependent on the file type. 
So some types of file, things like uh, JPEG photographs, things like Microsoft Word documents, both Doc and DocX, things like uh, Excel spreadsheets, things like uh, PDF documents. These files are, have a specific structure and within that structure includes or may include some metadata. And I say may um, because it isn't always there. The structure basically allows for that metadata, but when that file is created, that is or modified, that's the point where that metadata may or may not be written. For example, this might include things like another created timestamp. It might include the author name. So in, in a Word document, you if you go and see the properties and open up that file tab, you can enter your name as the author name. You can enter comments, keywords, uh, all sorts of a description for the document, a title for the document. That's all embedded metadata within the file. And because it's embedded within the file itself, we call it file metadata, but it is heavily dependent on the type of file uh, because that dictates that structure and that dictates what metadata can be stored within that particular file. But just because it can be stored doesn't mean it always is. So you may or may not find that metadata within that file, but the file system metadata will always be there because that's dependent on the file system, not the file itself. So for every file created on that system, there will be file system metadata. How much metadata depends on the file system, but there will be some metadata there within the file system. And just to show you the difference between these two, this is another JPEG file. And on the left-hand side, as you look at this, you have the file system metadata, which is, as I said, things like file name, created, created timestamp, the path, the size, all of those types of things. On the right-hand side, I appreciate it's really small writing, but it, you don't need to read it. It's just to show the magnitude of how much data can be in file metadata, can be embedded within that file. And particularly for a JPEG, it can be a lot. It can be a heck of a lot. You can have exposure information, whether the flash went off, the dimensions of the photograph, the created timestamp, the make and model of camera that took that photograph, the camera serial number, potentially, if it's a digital camera. You can have a GPS latitude and longitude for the location where that photograph was taken. Uh, you can have all sorts of things in there. So that's just a very small snapshot shown in, in this, this screen of the type of metadata that you may or may not get. And there's more, <laughs> there's, there's often, often more. Things like a Word document might include the person who last saved that document, the author's name, how many words are in that document, how many uh, paragraphs are in that document, how many hours have been spent editing that particular file, the date and time the file was created, the date and time the file was last printed and saved. Lots and lots of data can be embedded within these types of document. And it's not just the data that is potentially useful to us. The data itself, the content of a Word document, might be might be useful. It might be a manual on how to make bombs. And if we're looking for terrorist information in a, in a terrorist case or um, that, that sort of case, that is, is relevant to us and we're going to want to look at that. But we also want to know who created that document, who last modified that document, how much time potentially was spent editing that document. That may show more of an intent to to create that particular content. So all of these things are just as helpful to us, potentially more in, in some cases. So that's why we're, we're kind of, I'm talking to you about both of these things and highlighting that these things exist. And I just want to illustrate that point uh, by talking about one of my favorite cases uh, to talk about, which is of the BTK killer. Now the BTK killer was a guy called Dennis Rader he nicknamed himself Head the BTK Killer, as you do, you know, um, stands for Bind, Torture, Kill, because that's what he did to all of his victims. He killed at least 10 people that we know of, potentially a lot more that, that we don't know of. They are the ones that, that he kind of confessed to in the end. And he got away with it for about 30 odd years. 
the police didn't have a clue who he was and he got a bit cocky because of this he got very very confident because nobody was was coming after him and he therefore decided to start basically taunting the police he was sending letters to the media he was sending leaving letters and things lying around in things like um i think it was home depot he left he left something uh, and they were being passed to the police to say i i did this murder i i killed this particular person naming that person and leaving things like uh, id from the victim to prove that that he was responsible for these and he would leave them in cereal boxes as a nod to being a serial killer so he, he really was confident and, and very messed up. Um, however, one of these items, one of these cereal boxes that he left for the police, in it, he wrote a letter asking the police if he was to give the police a floppy disk drive. Uh, yes, this was in the, the, actually this was early 2000s, he was sending these. So around about uh, 2003, 2004, he, uh, he sent this saying, if I if I gave you a floppy disk drive, would you be able to trace it back to me? Tell me the truth. Be honest with me. I, I'm trusting you to be honest with me. Will you be able to trace that back to me? And of course, the police seized this opportunity and responded in, in through the media. That's how they were communicating with him to say, no, nope, no, nope, we, we can't do this. There's no way we can we can trace anything back to you if you give us a floppy disk drive. And Dennis Rader thought, great, okay, brilliant. So he gave them a floppy disk drive. And on it was the, the letter that he'd written for the police, but also there was a deleted Word document, deleted Microsoft Word document. And within that particular document, there was metadata that showed that the last person who saved that particular file was somebody called Dennis. There was also metadata within that document that pointed to a particular church. And doing a, a search on the internet for that church and somebody called Dennis came up with Dennis Rader uh, because he was heavily involved in the church at the time and it was very straightforward to make that link. So they went knocking and they arrested him. And as they did, his immediate reaction was just surprise and, and anger because the police had lied to him. It wasn't the fact he'd been caught, it was the fact the police had specifically said, no, we can't trace you from a floppy disk drive. And then they did simply through the metadata of a deleted docx file. So just to emphasize, metadata can be extremely useful. And in that case, the, the content of the, the document itself wasn't of particular interest. So the data itself wasn't wasn't that relevant, but the metadata was what got them to 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 get their guy, and he went to prison for a very long time. As well as understanding what data and metadata are, we also need to understand how to interpret that data, how to show its potential relevance to our investigation, and to do that, we first need to understand how that data is stored on an electronic device. Data is stored in a few different layers. Most users don't kind of go below the operating system. They, they use applications. So at the moment I am talking to you using Zoom, which is an application that is running on all of our systems. That application is installed on the operating system. So maybe you're running Windows, maybe you're running Mac OS, maybe you're running Linux or Android or iOS if you're on a smartphone. That operating system is something we interact with and we also interact with the applications, but the applications sit on top of the operating system. Underneath that is, is what I'm going to, to run through next. So starting with the bottom of that pyramid, data is stored in binary, in bits and bytes. It's stored as, as ones and zeros. A single zero or a single one is called a bit. Bits are grouped together into sets of eight, which are called bytes. And half a byte is a nibble. So if you think of, if you take a big bite out of something or you nibble it, uh, a nibble is, is half a byte or four bits. It's otherwise potentially known as, as base two. You may hear it called base two. And that's simply because there are two potential options for each 
bit. There's a zero or there's a one. And this is this is just to illustrate what it looks like. We have one byte here, which is zero one zero 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 one. All of that is is one byte. That is our data. We we can see that's the the, the contents of the data. We also need to know how to interpret that. And there are many different ways that we can interpret that particular byte. For example, the capital letter A in, in the ASCII character set, so in, in the English language, is, is this, is, is stored like this as, as one byte. So that's just one way of interpreting this particular byte of data. And we need to have those two bits of information. We need to know what the data is and how to interpret that data in order to make sense of it, analyze it, and do our investigation. But we don't look at, we don't talk in, in bytes. Uh, it would take forever for me to say, okay, uh, I have this byte 00011011. And uh, yeah, we, we don't talk that way. We tend to talk in hexadecimal as digital forensic examiners. Before I talk about hexadecimal, I just want to break down a numbering system that is more familiar to everybody in decimal. Most, most of us think in decimal in, in normal everyday life and, and mathematics. And if we think about how we break down decimal numbers, that helps us to better understand things like hexadecimal, which is a different way of looking at the same data. Decimal, otherwise known as base 10, because we have 10 options. We have the numbers 0 to 9. If we have the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we can automatically read that as 12,345 because this is the numbering system that we use every day. But if we break that down, what you actually have is five ones, four tens, three hundreds, two thousands, and one ten thousand. Otherwise known as five times 10 to the zero, because 10 to the zero is one, four times 10 to the one, three times 10 to the two, two times 10 to the three, and one times 10 to the four. So you can see our multipliers as, as we go across, we start from the right hand side and we go 10 to the power zero, 10 to the power one, 10 to the power two, and, and all the way along. And, and that's how we, we break it down and we understand that number. In hexadecimal, instead of having just 10 options, we have 16 options. So this is known as base 16. We have the numbers 0 to 9, but we then extend that character set by basically carrying on counting 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. But we have to put those into single characters. So instead of 10, we say A. Instead of 11, we say B and, and so on. So we get 0 to 9, A to F as we go through. And as you can see in this table, each hexadecimal value is four bits, it's a nibble. So when I talk about a byte of data, I will have two hexadecimal characters that make up one hexadecimal value. So every value in hex is always two characters side by side. And we tend to write them as zero X and then the two characters. So if I say nine A in hex, it will be zero X nine A. And we write it that way to make sure we can differentiate between hexadecimal and decimal. Because if I was just writing one, two, we don't know if that's 12 in decimal or one, two in hexadecimal. So by putting zero X at the beginning, we know that is a hexadecimal value. With that in mind, this is how we, we read data and this is how we look at a byte of data and we get to the hexadecimal value. So just to, to walk you through this, we start out with a byte. We have 00101011 at the top of this slide. We split that out into two nibbles. So just put a, a bigger gap in between the two nibbles because we know each four byte value is going to be one hexadecimal character. So we calculate those two separately. We then come up with our multipliers. So in, in, uh, in binary, we have two to the power zero, two to the power one, two to the power two, two to the power three. So our multipliers here, the one, two, four, eight, going from the right hand side, just as we did with, with decimal numbering, when we broke that number down, we add those multipliers here, but this time it's two to the power. So one times two to the power zero is, is one. One times two to the power one is two. Zero times two to the power three is zero, because it's always zero when you multiply by zero. 
um, and then one times two to the power three uh, is eight. So we add eight, two and one and we get 11. And remember that I said we get naught to nine and then we have to start counting. Instead of going 10, 11, 12, we go A, B, C. So 11 is the letter B. So on the right hand side, we have a B. We do the same on the left hand side. You can see we have no ones, we have one, two, no fours and no eights. So it's two on the left hand side. So we bring those two together at that point and we would write this hexadecimal value as 0x to b. And, and that's the way that hexadecimal works. Above our bits and bytes, so that's that was our lowest level of, of the data. As we understand it, above that we then have sectors and clusters. Bytes of data are grouped together into sectors and clusters. A sector is typically 512 bytes at this point in time. That's the, the most common value you will come across. However, that is not guaranteed. It's set by the device manufacturer and it is written into the, the file system header. So you can see that value and, and verify it is 512 bytes. But at the moment, most of them are, are set uh, as a default to 512 bytes. In the future, it's likely to become 4096. It is, will be the common value. Uh, so as I say, don't always assume it's necessarily 512. But at the moment, that's probably the, the one you're most likely to come across in an investigation. So each 512 bytes is grouped together, and that's called a sector. And then you have eight sectors is a cluster. A cluster is the smallest amount of space that the operating system can see and write to. So you create a file on a system. If the file is less than 4096 bytes, which is eight sectors, then it will be written into one cluster. Once a file occupies a cluster, no other space in that cluster can be used. That entire cluster is used by that file, whether the data fills it or not, the operating system allocates that cluster. So that is the, the smallest space that the system can, can see and can use. Each individual cluster is labeled by the operating system as either allocated or unallocated. Allocated simply means a file is in it. It's allocated to a file, so no other file can use it. Unallocated simply means it's not currently allocated to any files on that system, so it's available to be used. And that's all those two terms mean. It's important to note, however, if a cluster is unallocated now, that does not mean it was never allocated to a file. You may have deleted files existing within unallocated clusters. So this is what we mean when we talk about unallocated space. It's areas of the disk that may contain deleted data that might be relevant to our investigation. You also have something called slack space. I mentioned if a file is smaller than a cluster size, it will be written to one cluster, but it won't occupy the entirety of that cluster. The space left over is what we call slack space. And this is actually, if, if we draw it out, uh, there's actually a few different types of, of slack space. You can see here, you have an entire cluster, which I've broken down here into eight different sectors. So you can see each of these uh, white markers is a, a sector boundary. The file only occupies this amount of space. So you have five and a third ish <laughs> sectors occupied by actual file content. You then have all of this bit. So two and two thirds ish sectors completely unused and nothing can use that space because it's allocated to this one particular file. Now, when this file is written, the operating system does slightly different things with these two bits of, sl of slack space. You have this area here, which is the end of the file's actual content to the end of that sector. So this is one sector here. This bit contains content and this bit doesn't, but this is all still one sector. This bit in here is what we call RAM slack. Has nothing to do with RAM. Um, it's a historical name. Um, this is zeroed. When you write a file, the rest of that sector is zeroed. The two sectors at the end here that aren't used by the file, completely unused sectors at the end of the cluster, 
they are just left alone. So if they previously contained any data, when this file is written, that data will still be there. Nothing else is, is going to use that space. Nothing else is written there. It's not zeroed, it's just left alone. So those, it, it's all Slack space at the end of the file, but it's two different types of Slack. RAM Slack is zeroed, file Slack, which is what we call the unused sectors, it isn't. So there may be deleted content in there as well that is of interest to us. There's actually a third type of Slack, uh, which I will mention. And this is the unused space potentially that may exist at the end of a file system. This is typically going to be smaller than the size of a cluster. It's typically very small, uh, unless hypothetically, uh, or it is technically possible for somebody to to create space at the end. Maybe they want to hide some data. Maybe a malicious attacker has deliberately created some volume slack to hide something. I've not seen that in the real world, but it is possible. Um, so there may be that, that case where that happens, but for the most part, it will be a tiny amount and it purely exists because the partition is not an exact uh, multiple of, of clusters. So there's a, a bit of space left over at the end where it wasn't able to allocate an entire cluster for the operating system to use. So it's just dead space, basically. It may contain deleted data, potentially. Uh, in most cases I've come across, it, it doesn't exist or it, it doesn't contain useful data, but it, it's you need to know about it and you can check for it if you, you have a case where you think it may, be, may exist or may be used. And to illustrate why we might want to look in, in Slack space, this is what happens when a file is deleted. I have a text file. You can see there's information that is highly relevant to my particular investigation in here. Uh, my Latin is now non-existent. I did study Latin. I don't remember any of it. Uh, but let's let's say this is relevant to our particular investigation. Somebody overwrites that file, they've deleted it, and they've decided to overwrite it with Baby Shark, because uh, Baby Shark was of more interest to them. And what's happened here is this second file, this image file, is smaller than the original text file. It's been written into the same space, but you then have this RAM slack, which is that space between the end of the file's content and the end of that cluster. So this is zeroed out. You can see it's blank. But then you can see there are two sectors at the bottom here that still contain part of our text file. And because that is a text file, we can read it. We can still see the contents of that particular file. If it was a zip file, for example, the data would still be there, but it's compressed and we don't have the header anymore. So we may not be able, we most likely can't recover that data at that point in time. But because this is a plain text file, we can recover that data. So we could see that is still relevant to our investigation and we're going to want to go and have a look at it. So that data there is our file slack and that's what we're going to, to look at in our investigation. And it's really easy to recover deleted files if they're still intact. So the previous example, it had been overwritten, but if it hadn't been, how do we recover that data? Uh, well, the answer is quite easy. Uh, if it hasn't been overwritten, all of that complete file still exists on the system, along with all of that metadata, the embedded metadata, because it's within the file and the file is intact, but also the file system metadata in this particular example. We can see this is a file named cruiseship.jpg, file name is in file system metadata. So that hasn't been overwritten, it's still there. And in this case, we can use a tool. In this case, I've used FTK Imager, which is just one of the tools you can use. And we can, we can literally just right click and export the file and have a look at it in any way we want. So really easy to recover intact files. And that middle layer in our pyramid was file systems. I briefly mentioned file systems, but what do I mean? Think of a file system as the digital equivalent of a filing cabinet. You have a filing cabinet that can contain files, it can contain folders, you can have files within folders, you can have folders within folders, you can have files loose in there. It's just a structure for you to be able to store files and folders. And that's all I mean by a file system. There are different types of file systems that you may come across. Windows by default 
at the moment is installed on NTFS, which is the new technology file system. That has been the case for many, many years. So if you ever look at a Windows system, you are likely to come across NTFS. You can also format USBs with NTFS if you so wish. It's not the default option, but you can. The default option will likely be FAT32 if it's a, a thumb drive or XFAT if it's an external USB. So those you are likely to come across. FAT32 was the old default for Windows. So if you come across probably Windows Server 2000 or something like that, some Windows XP maybe, although that's when NTFS came in, you may come across FAT32. You may come across XFAT if somebody has chosen to format the file system in that way. So they're the main ones for Windows. Mac OS, the newer Macs will be APFS, so Apple File System. Older Macs will be HFS plus. If you're on Linux, it will be ext4, probably. Uh, the default used to be ext3. Then used to be ext2. <laughs> there's, a, there's a pattern. Uh, these, these are just some of the common ones that you may come across. And it's just different, different filing cabinets, different instructions for how the operating system should be storing files and folders. And as I mentioned, for each of these different file systems, the file system metadata that is stored, so the type and the amount of file system metadata will differ slightly between those. For example, NTFS stores way more timestamps in file system metadata than FAT32. So just, just one example where those things differ. And now that we've talked about what we mean by digital evidence, where do we find it? Where can we actually get hold of that digital evidence that is relevant to do our investigation? The answer is pretty much everywhere. Um, any electronic device is, is the short answer to that. Uh, this is a non-exhaustive list, but just things that, think about what you have around the home. You have desktop computers, laptop computers, you'll have tablets, mobile devices, USBs, removable media. You might have Internet of Things devices. You might have a, a Google Home, uh, Amazon Alexa, cameras, a ring doorbell, all sorts of, of things around the home. You may have drones. I've yet to play with a drone, but I need to add that to my, my to-do list for fun. Uh, vehicles, if you have a car, then that's basically a, a mass of, of moving computers. There's your head unit, but there's also uh, electronic devices that control everything, the lights, the doors, uh, the the signals, the brakes, everything is, is controlled by a computer on a vehicle. So pretty much everywhere, there's, there's data all over. Uh, networks, if you have a network set up, the cloud, everything we do now, and increasingly so as we go along, data is stored in the cloud. So we, we also have to go and look there uh, to go and grab the data that may be relevant to our particular investigation. That is digital evidence. Moving on to digital investigation and, and what that means. What do I mean by digital investigation? It's simply a process that we go through to ask questions about what happened and try and find answers to that. We need to try and work out what the series of digital events were that happened on that particular system. And we do that by following a process of identifying what may be of interest, acquiring our data, processing and interpreting our data, analysing it to determine those events and write a report based on the findings that we come across, all of which is relevant to the investigation. We ignore things that aren't relevant to that particular investigation. And we say this should be done by someone who has had some sort of training to do this. And we say this because if you are acquiring data, if you are interpreting data and reporting on it to tell your, your client or stand up in a, a court of law and explain what happened, you need to do that correctly. And it's, it's very easy to get it to get it wrong. If you don't acquire data in the right way, you can change the data. You can erase data quite easily by, by doing something in the wrong way. So that's why we say it's, it's important to know what you're doing. 
in order to conduct an investigation in this way. And an investigation, as I said, asks questions. It tries to find answers to those questions. We're looking for the what, why, when, where, how. I may have missed one out. What, when, why, where, yeah, how. All the questions as to what happened on that system. As we start to try and answer those questions, we will probably come up with more questions. That's the way investigation works. You have lines of inquiry, you dig in to that line of inquiry and potentially get to the end or come to some sort of evidence that, that proves it or disproves it. You work your way back and you go down another line of inquiry. It's this kind of dance almost of uh, looking at the evidence and working out exactly what happened and making sure you get the facts in that particular case. You will have lots of stakeholders, most likely, or you have at least one stakeholder, right? Somebody's asked you to do the investigation. It may be clients, it may be in a legal setting, you may have attorneys, it may be human resources. If it's an internal case, it can be a mixture of all of these things. So lots of different angles that we come from. And there are lots of different types of case. These are just some of the investigations that you might come across. It is by no means an exhaustive list, but just to walk through what some of these are. Incident response and threat hunting are basically two sides of the same coin. Incident response is where you receive an alert. Something has happened on a system, on a network, and you need to respond to that. So this is a reactive process. You get the notification, you go and investigate. It may be something like uh, an intrusion, it may be phishing, it may be malware and attackers in the system, or unauthorized access, denial of service, all of these things. You will likely have someone monitoring your networks, they get an alert, you go and investigate. Threat hunting is assuming that a breach has occurred, but without having evidence of it, and actively going off and looking, hunting for evidence of that particular breach. This is all about understanding what looks normal on your network and on your systems, having threat intelligence, having indicators of compromise, information about known attacks that you can go off and search for. You can use those indicators and go and search your network and try and find evidence that some sort of incident has occurred, but that you haven't received an alert for. So this is, this is a similar kind of process, but it's proactive. You're actively hunting for something that's happened. We then have DOMEX, Document and Media Exploitation. This is all about intelligence and less about the strict process of evidence and, and best practice around evidence. You have severe time pressures. It may be something like a, a child has been kidnapped. You only have a very short window to be able to get to the data as quickly as possible, analyze it and find something useful to be able to act on it, to go in and find that child before it's too late. It's, it's that sort of case. So heavy time pressures and much more about the intelligence than it is about following process, getting all of the data and doing a thorough investigation. It's very targeted and it's it's really high time pressure. Uh, you have other military action. So Domex can be a military environment. Uh, the example I gave was, was, was child kidnap, but it could be that you have, uh, you're in the field in, in a battle and you need to get that intelligence quickly to be able to determine what your troops next action needs to be. So that can be a military focus as well, but then you can have other military based action. And this is where there's less of a, a time, less of a heavy time pressure. You still need to get to the information quickly. It's still all about intelligence, but it's not quite as heavily focused on, on time pressure. You don't have that missing child, uh, but you do need to make sure that your troops are heading in the right direction. So it's not an immediate need, but it is still a focus on triage and it's still a focus on grabbing that intelligence and acting upon it while you still can. We then have auditing, and this is where we are using an investigation to assure that companies are following 
the processes that they should be following. They're following standards they should be should be following, uh, and they are doing their their work in the right way. They're following the standards that they claim to be complying with. It's all about providing that assurance around all of those things, around uh, processes and systems in, in an organisation. Regulatory investigations. So regulators are empowered by law to be able to investigate organisations to make sure they are behaving in the right way and to protect consumers. And if uh, they are if they need investigating, so somebody maybe makes a complaint to a regulator about an organisation, they can then launch an investigation and go and do a formal inquiry into that particular set of circumstances. So all the same processes in terms of doing the investigation, but it has a focus on what should that company be doing and have they have they followed the correct procedures and, and all of those things. It can be things like insider trading, fraud, um, negligence, or all of those types of things. And there are loads of regulatory bodies worldwide. Uh, these are just some of them on this particular slide, but there are loads of them in various different countries that do these types of investigations. You can have internal investigations. This is mostly what I do day in, day out, uh, looking, working with HR, and looking at things like uh, acceptable use policies in organizations and are employees complying with that or are they looking at websites they shouldn't be looking at are they stealing information are they connecting devices they shouldn't be connecting to particular systems depending on what the the, the policy dictates for that particular system these are generally not legal cases they're not criminal acts they, they could be uh, you could have an example where an employee is looking at illegal material online. It does happen. Uh, why people do things at work, I have no idea, uh, but it, it can it can happen and it does happen. So it can become a criminal investigation. And for that, re any investigation can become a criminal investigation. And for that reason, we say always, always, always follow the correct procedures for dealing with evidence. However, these are just one example where it's not expected they would become criminal from the word go, but we follow those processes anyway. And then you do have criminal and civil litigation, so legal cases. And it will be either criminal law or civil law. Criminal law deals with an offence against the state. So this is where it may be an individual, it may be an organisation, but basically a law has been broken. Civil law deals with uh, an injury to an individual or an organization. This is likely to be something like somebody claiming compensation for an injury walking down the street because the path was broken or, or something along those lines. With all of these, uh, any, any offense, so anything, any criminal act can involve digital devices. We tend to think, of, Lots of people tend to think, oh, I know, I've got a criminal case and it involves digital forensics, so it must be cybercrime, cyber warfare. Um, it, it could be, but actually every single crime can have a digital element to it. If you think about somebody commits a homicide, maybe they were carrying a smartphone, maybe the victim was carrying a smartphone, maybe they did it in a place where there was lots of CCTV, maybe there were Internet of Things devices, maybe there was a, a video doorbell, maybe uh, there was a Google Home that recorded everything that was said. All of these things uh, are their digital evidence, they are things that we can use in that particular investigation. So yeah, just because it's not a, a, a cyber crime type thing, it doesn't mean it, it won't include digital devices. And with all of these things, we need to deal with the courts we, we have to go through the courts and we have to make sure we preserve the evidence properly we do all of our documentation properly to be able to present that to the court and do it in a way that they will accept our evidence and our findings when we when we report and when we testify the difference between criminal and civil criminal litigation you have to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt civil litigation is a balance of probabilities. So one side of the argument simply has to prove the case 
better than the other side of the, the argument. So that's less for us to worry about as, as digital forensic analysts, but it's good to be aware of, of how these things work uh, for when we go to, and testify if we need to. We also, from a digital forensic perspective, we might need to deal with some constraints with civil litigation, which are incredibly frustrating, uh, but we need to be aware of them. There may be things like privileged data. If I go and talk to my lawyer, that data is privileged. And it may be that that data is excluded from any investigation of my particular device. So something to be aware of. There may be data we cannot acquire. There may be data we cannot analyze and we just need to accept that's the way it is. And any findings we come across are based on what we could analyze, what we could acquire. And we just ignore every, everything else that we couldn't look at. Summary, lots of different types of investigation. The process that we follow, the documentation that we produce is the same for all of them. We still need to follow best practice advice in the industry. We need to make sure our evidence is, is uh, preserved properly, collected properly. All of our documentation is put together. The difference between these is more around which questions we're asking. So that who, what, why, when, where, how. Different types of questions, different angle, different artifacts we're going to be looking at, but the process and, and all of those skills are the same in all these different types of investigation. Moving on to what is digital forensics, which is why you're all here, <laughs> really. So I needed to talk about digital evidence and investigation before actually talking about digital forensics as a whole. And digital forensics is just bringing all of that together. It's the process of how do we identify which evidence is relevant in our case? How do we acquire it? How do we properly preserve it and store it? We need to make sure that evidence is not changed in any, in any way, if we possibly can. It's preserved as we go through the case so that we are analyzing the actual data. We need to interpret that data properly. We need to report on that data and present on that data, potentially in a way that, it, well, always in a way that is legally acceptable because potentially we're going to go to court. Even if we don't, it still needs to maintain that, that legal acceptability. We still need to present to clients, to stakeholders, to HR, to whoever our stakeholders are, and therefore we still need to maintain those standards. And the way that we do this is that we use best practice, we use scientifically derived and proven methods, best practice in the industry to do all of these things. And in that way, we maintain consistency, we make sure that we do things in the right way and in an acceptable way so that everyone is, is on the same page and they can have confidence that we've, we've done our job properly. In doing this, we need to understand what our digital evidence is, how to interpret that data, when artifacts are created, what circumstances lead to particular artifacts being created. So therefore, what our digital evidence can show us. We need to be working out what the facts are of that particular case, because it's our job to present on the facts. That That's all our job is, is to work out what the actual events were that occurred on that system, how that digital evidence was created and used, what actions a user performed on that system. And that's what we're presenting. That's our job to, to put all that together. We need to, to do that properly. We need to understand a little bit about the history of digital forensics. How did we get to where we are now? Because it took a while. <laughs> we, we are now in a, a really good place where we have really well established processes, guidelines, best practice. We have an incredible community of digital forensic practitioners, a lot of whom spend a lot of their own time doing research and development, producing amazing tools that are really useful for the rest of us. Things like Examen suite of tools, things like uh, Sarah Edwards Apollo, things like Alexis Brignoni's iLeap, all of these things. Uh, have a look on uh, the sans.org slash free, bunch of free tools that a lot of the community have developed. And 
they're amazing and we have all of that because we've we've kind of gone through this progression through the the decades starting from from nowhere basically so digital forensics back in the 80s wasn't a thing <laughs> that it, it didn't really exist back in the 80s we just really started to get personal computers they were very expensive they were really only owned by hobbyists by universities primarily by businesses people who had enough money to be able to acquire these these bricks as they were because they were massive things and generally i mean there was no concept of, of crime on a computer and the the incidents that happened were generally just in terms of, of cost how much does it cost to, to fix this thing if you haven't read the cookies egg this this book by clifford stoll i would highly recommend it it's a very good read about how in in the 80s i think it was 1986 or 87 he basically came across a minimal accounting error and in order to try and or in the process of trying to work out what actually happened he detected an attacker in the system and it's all about that journey of going through identifying this this one tiny accounting error that most people may have missed and picked away at that thread and pulled and pulled and pulled and eventually found an attacker in the network so it's a very good read i highly recommend that book to anyone and everyone if you haven't read it already moving forward 10 years to the 90s this is when computers were in every, in well a lot of homes not every home but more and more people bought computers at this point in time this is i had a computer in the 90s i got the internet in 1996 i believe it was aol of course because everyone had aol uh, online with the um you got mail yeah uh, that probably wasn't a good impression anyway um, everyone had aol and the dial-up modem which i can still remember the, the weird whizzy sound that dial-up makes when you connect to, to aol uh, you, you set it off you walk away you go grab a drink and you come back in and and hopefully it's connected by that point in time i don't really miss those days um, but this is where we had more people with computers homes were connected at this point in time you had things like Netscape and you started to have browsers to, to go and access the internet and you could go and um, do lots of instant messaging with random strangers. That was the great thing about AOL back then. We had storage media. We had lots of floppy disks at this point in time. Uh, I yeah, remember floppy disks, not so much the, the actual floppy ones, the, the larger five and a quarter. It was more the, the three and a half inch ones that are in this picture here. We started to get um, standards as well. So this is where digital forensics really did start to develop as a, a field. And this is where we have the, the ACPO guidelines, which I'll talk about. So these were the first best practice guidelines that were produced on how to deal with digital evidence. Digital evidence was recognized at this point in time. The police had started to have to deal with, with crimes being committed on computers. So guidelines were put together to try and tell people the best way of dealing with these things. So this is where standards started to come into play. And after we had the ACPO guidelines, that's the Association of Chief Police Officers, um, we started to then have SWGDE then picked up on that and, and brought out some standards and they now have loads of standards. 2000s, we then got Windows XP, yay, uh, which was the best operating system for many years until it was discontinued. We got search engines, we got Google. This is where the internet became really searchable and really useful to people. We got the first smartphones, we got the first iPhone. And then of course, as soon as we got the first iPhone, we got the first Android smartphone, not long afterwards. And this is where mobile phone usage really took off because you had a portable computer in your pocket at this point in time. This is a decade where we started to get training and research and, and workshops and conferences and, and more and more collaboration in the community. The first iterations of, of SANS FOR 408 and 508 came out in this decade. We had DFR 
DWS, I always get those the wrong way around, a digital forensic research workshop, which is where the community started talking about research and development that they were doing in the field of digital forensics. So this is where things really took off with, with training and, and all of those awesome things that we kind of take for granted now. 2010s is where we kind of saw evolution really in terms of electronic devices more data stored in the cloud, more storage available on devices, more internet of things, more connectivity, constant updates. There are millions and millions of applications for Android, for iOS, for Windows, for BlackBerry, for Windows Phone, if you want to go back to this kind of this kind of time. So many systems, so many applications. We started to see encryption. We started to see things like Snapchat, where you you can uh, delete chats. We now have, of course, lots of applications that do that. Things like Signal, WhatsApp now has uh, chats that automatically disappear. All of those things started to become a thing and are now much more prevalent um, these days. We started to see lots of data breaches as well in this decade. And we did get a bit of breach fatigue. I think, I mean, I, I get notifications fairly regularly saying, this LinkedIn's been hacked, uh, this, this other website's been hacked, your data's been leaked. And the more notifications that users get about these types of breaches, you do kind of just think, oh, that's happened again, fine. Uh, let's just file away this email and yeah, my information's already out there. Um, so we kind of got a lot of these in, in this decade and we still, to be fair, get, get a lot now. All of these things, these developments, have led to a few challenges and we still have these challenges today getting around encryption for example if you're trying to acquire a device you don't have the password it's encrypted it's turned off we have issues <laughs> these are all challenges that we need to to try and get around so this is where those challenges really started and they're only only evolving um, as we go through so now what now what happens uh, this is kind of where I often throw it out to the to the floor. What what does everyone predict from from 2020 and, and beyond? Throw your ideas in Slack. Uh, let let me know what you think. The pandemic's been a, an interesting one. I think in many ways it's accelerated a lot of changes that may have happened anyway, but but more slowly. Things like there's now a lot more remote working. So remote working capability has taken a big leap forward. If you think about Zoom, everyone, we're on Zoom now, everyone suddenly decided to get Zoom in, in March last year. It became the application to use for video calling. Whereas beforehand, I think it was a small minority who'd even heard, I, had, I hadn't heard of the application um, before March 2020. And then all of a sudden everyone was using it, including our prime minister in the UK for the daily COVID briefs. So. There you go, it was catapulted into the limelight. As a consequence, it's had a lot of updates since that point in time. It's become much more secure because originally it wasn't too secure uh, because they hadn't had that opportunity really. It was still quite new and they hadn't had so many thousands of users on it. So that's just one example where I think the pandemic has accelerated technological development. And I think it, hopefully, Hopefully that's, that's a good thing that will come out of all of this. Hopefully that will continue and we will see some of those, those really cool things coming out in the years ahead. We, we shall see, watch this space, I think. So why do we do digital forensics? What's the, what's the purpose of it? Just to work out what happened, that, that's, that's all we're trying to do. What happened on that device? What were the events that led to an incident that we're investigating or the reason behind us doing this investigation. Everything we do has to be repeatable and that's why we follow best practice guidelines, we follow accepted methodology because that's been that's what everybody knows, that's what's proven to be a good way of doing it and if we write our report, we write down everything we do, I could hand that to a colleague, they could repeat exactly what I did and come to the same conclusion. That's that's the reason that we do everything following all of these, these guidelines and, and methodologies based on our current understanding. Our understanding changes as everything generally does, particularly with technology. 
it evolves, it adapts over time as new operating systems come out, new applications come out, we discover new artifacts, artifacts change potentially over time. The, the whole field is constantly evolving. So as does our understanding of, of devices, of processes, of tools, of everything that we rely on on digital forensics. We need to ask the right questions. One of the skills in digital forensics is about asking, learning to ask questions. What are the questions we should be asking? What questions can we answer and what questions can't we answer? And we need to make sure we back up all of our answers with corroborating evidence. If we find one artifact that tells us one thing that happens, we need to try and get as much corroborating evidence as possible to back that up before we produce our report, before we, we, we reach our conclusions. So that's why, why we have it, why we do it, and why we do it in depth. ACPO principles, I mentioned, came in the late 1990s. This was a team of UK chief police officers. Uh, just because it was developed in the UK, don't be, don't be fooled. Uh, it is used globally, and it was the first standard that came out, the first guidelines that came out. So this was widely adopted everywhere, and a lot of the current standards we have today are based on exactly these principles. And it consists of four principles. Principle one, do not do anything that will change your data if possible. Principle two says it may be possible to sometimes access original data, which will change that data. If you need to do that, make sure the person doing so is competent and they are able to explain exactly what they did and the implications of what they did. Principle three says document everything, write everything down, create an audit trail, document exactly what you did and when you did it. Principle four says that somebody needs to be ultimately in charge of the investigation and responsible for the entire team adhering to these principles and the law. So putting that into practice, principle one, if possible, don't change the evidence. If we can use a write blocker, so a write blocker is just a device. It may be software, it may be hardware, but you put it between your evidence item, your electronic device and your analysis machine, and it just stops your analysis machine from writing to your evidence. If we can do that, we should do that. There are circumstances where you can't do that, and that moves on to, to principle two. And principle two says, there are some cases where you need to access the original data. For example, if I'm acquiring a mobile device, I can't pull it apart and remove the hard drive. I need to turn that device on to access the data. I'm accessing it live. In that instance, I can't use a write blocker. I just have to be able to explain exactly what I did. Did I change the data in any, in any way? What data did I change? what are the implications of the actions I did on that particular device? Because if I can't explain all of those things and I go into a courtroom and the lawyer stands up and says, you changed this data on the device, therefore everything you're saying wasn't something that my client did, it's something that you did when you accessed the device. And it's about being able to explain why that, that's not an accurate picture of, of what happened. Principle three, document it, <laughs> simple as that. Documentation is the non-glamorous side of digital forensics, but it is one of the, the most important aspects. If you didn't, if you don't document it, it didn't happen. It is the short version to this. And write everything down when you do it, as you do it, so that you remember exactly what happened. Back it up with photographs, back it up with videos if you can, and make sure all of that is is properly filed so that you can access it when you need to, you can refer back to notes when you need to write a report. You can't write too much. It, it's not a thing to have written too much down, but it is a thing to not write enough down. If you don't write it down and you need to then refer back to what you did later on and you haven't got those notes, guess what? You have to do it all again. And that's not fun. So write everything down and write down more than you think is, is enough. Last but not least, in the ACPO principles, someone has to be in charge. 
<laughs> basically you can delegate responsibility for particular tasks for collecting evidence for writing a report but not accountability somebody has to be accountable to make sure the team is properly qualified they have the right skills the right competency they know what they're doing they are following the standards they should be following they are doing their documentation they're adhering to the law they're getting getting authorizations when they need to all of those things one person has to be accountable for that and and that's all principle four states i just want to throw in this slide here to say be wary of, of the expert label i personally hate the word expert um expert has specific specific meaning specific connotations um, i think so i tend to use the word specialist practitioners need to understand what their own strengths and weaknesses are and what the strengths and weaknesses of their team are everyone has limitations you can be really really good and know loads and loads of things about say windows artifacts on a windows system but maybe you don't look at mac systems very often so you're not as confident you're, you don't have as many skills on the mac os system maybe you don't do reverse engineering of malware very often so you're not a specialist in that maybe you don't do memory analysis that often everyone has their own areas that they they specialize in and one person cannot know everything about all of those things so an expert in digital forensics all of digital forensics is isn't a thing uh, people will specialize in in one topic or or a few topics but everyone can't know everything about everything so i try and avoid uh, the word expert i would use specialist and it's important to understand your own limitations your team's limitations and also get that point across to your stakeholders because stakeholders can expect a lot they may not understand where the limitations are in a team and you may need to call out specialists in from an external team or um, external organization if you need to to fill gaps in reporting and, and get the the right results for your particular investigation don't be afraid to do that have those relationships built up in advance and make sure your client understands what you can and can't do there are many challenges as i mentioned that we come across just to name a few well yeah i, I probably won't cover all of these um but things like rapidly changing technology updates are happening all the time to operating systems to applications that changes artifacts and we need to know how those artifacts change maybe they change location maybe they change the way they store data the amount of data stored uh, the maybe they compress data now when they didn't before we have devices that are storing more data you now have a smartphone that comes in 256 gigs by default it used to be four gigs or eight gigs a few years ago so everything is just blowing up in size more data is stored in the cloud which may or may not be accessible to you and in, in an investigation trying to recruit people into digital forensic teams can be difficult uh, we are an interesting breed <laughs> we we're quite analytical uh, you kind of need people who want to to investigate to dig into the data to question things and and come up with the the right conclusions you also need people who can look at, at data all day, can, can look at hex and not go cross-eyed, um, can do difficult cases. You may have cases involving child abuse, involving homicide, involving co-workers if you're doing uh, internal HR cases. So you need people who can, who can deal with that and you need to be able to support the mental health of your team in doing those sorts of cases you need to keep up with the field. The field changes all the time. There's new tools coming out, new artifacts coming out, and it's a, a bit of a, a cat and mouse game when it comes to, to all those types of things. So ongoing education is, is critical to keeping the team current, keeping them up to date on, on everything. Tools are great. We also need to understand how to look at the data manually. We can become over-reliant on tools and just click, 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 click buttons. 
but we need to make sure we can verify that their output is correct. So we need to still have those skills and capabilities to be able to do manual analysis and verify our tools are working. And we should always be verifying that our tools are working as we expect. You may get unsupported devices, things like Internet of Things devices may not be supported by tools. So what do we do with that? Uh, they, they, are, they are still challenges. Encryption is becoming more and more common and anti-forensics may, may be a thing on your particular case. And if an attacker has deleted all of the evidence, then that's a, a big challenge when it comes to doing an investigation. Last but not least, how can digital forensics help you? What type of investigations do we do? What type of artifacts do we come across? Here is just a small <laughs> number of the types of artifacts you may come across on different systems, on, on networks, on, on all sorts of different things. This red poster here is Windows artifacts. So these are all available um, from, from SANS through your portal. And I have these plastered all over my, my walls because I'm referring to them constantly. You're never gonna remember everything. Uh, so just have these to hand so you can refer to them. The, the red poster, I say is all Windows artifacts. This gray one here is network forensics. You have finding malware on this blue one. How do you know what's normal uh, and what processes should be running versus what is running on your system? Memory forensics and smartphone forensics. Uh, there's a, another one just come out as well that uh, Mattia Afani wrote, which is all about third party applications on smartphones as well. So, and there are plenty of other posters available, um, but these are really good reference sheets. And you're not meant to be able to read all of these things. It's just to show you the sheer scale really of the different artifacts that, that are available, that are out there and that we use in different types of investigation. To just walk through uh, towards the end, don't worry, we're coming to the end. Um, just to walk through an example of the types of artifact that might be useful in a particular case. I'm gonna talk about malware execution. This is a malware case. The first thing that I would be looking at on a Windows system is evidence of program execution. Which applications ran on this system? When did they run? Which applications ran immediately after an application ran? What other artifacts were created immediately after that thing ran? So we're gonna start with the red poster and the red box uh, looking at Windows, starting with things like prefetch, which shows applications that ran on the system. It will give you dates and times that that application ran. It will also potentially show you files that were accessed by that application when it last ran. So you can then potentially also dig into, into those files. I'm going to look at things like event logs. Depending on what event logging is turned on will depend on how much information that might give you, but that might give you useful information about what ran on that system. Information in the registry, things like most recently used, will again show you what applications ran and, and we can add all of these things together. User assist, same thing, the activity cache database, S Windows 10 timeline, jump lists, all of these things will give you different, slightly different evidence, but corroborating evidence on which applications ran on that system. From there, we can then look at other other types of data. So what also happened around the same time? I mentioned prefetch data may give you evidence of which files were accessed by that application. We can then look at evidence of file access. So things like MRU lists, most recently used lists in the registry, which files were opened by the user, which files were um, saved by the user uh, at, at that particular point in time. Shell bags shows us which folders were accessed at, at that particular point in time. We can look at shortcuts. So link files will show us which files were accessed at, at a particular point in time. We can back this up with, with jump lists, with other recent data. All of this again is corroborating evidence as to what happened at that point in time. So we've seen an application run, we can note the timestamp of that and we can then pivot from that and say, what else happened at that point in time? What files and folders were accessed at around the same time? immediately before and immediately after that malware ran. And then from there, where do we go? We can look to see, we need to find out where that malware came from 
so we can look for evidence of USB devices being connected. Again, we're going to look in the registry. There will potentially be, uh, so in the USB store key, any USBs that were created, we can get the, uh, the make and model, we can get the serial number, and we can get some timestamps associated with that. We can get the volume name, the drive letter it was mounted as. We can look in link files and see which files were accessed from that USB device. We can also look in things like browser usage, what browsers are on that system, look in browser history to see were any files accessed, uh, is, were any websites visited, was it downloaded, was it a drive-by download from a particular website, did it come from email, did they access email through the browser, and maybe it was downloaded that way. So we can, again, we can pivot again around that same timestamp to look for each of these different ways in to see how did that malware get on that particular system. And often you'll get the user saying, I didn't do it, someone else must have done. Uh, was it actually malware or did the user do it? This is, we always need to, to start with our hypothesis, try and look for evidence of that happening, try and look for evidence specifically saying that didn't happen and then go from there and try and reach the right conclusion. So. We've started this as a malware investigation, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe the user actually did these actions. And by looking at the evidence, we can determine that that happened. 